You are listening to Packers Talk. This Green Bay Packers podcast is brought to you by Mayfield Sports Marketing, our official sports marketing agent for player appearances. To book a Packers player for your next event, go to PackersTalk.com and click on Player Appearances. Are you looking for some signed Packer memorabilia? Look no further than Waukesha Sports Cards. If the Green Bay Packer can sign it, Waukesha Sports Cards has it. Check our website for upcoming Packer player and legend signing. Go to WaukeshaSportsCards.com. Amanda, come in. 10-4. Have you infiltrated the security system yet? Locked and loaded. Ready to lower myself into the enemy war room. I'm lowering you down now. I have access. The Packers are in for a tough one this week. I need the password to proceed. The password is read option. I hate that password. Me too. You know which wires to cut. Always go for the green and gold. Here we go. I'm Amanda Gaffrey. And I'm Chris Calloway, and you're going with us behind, behind enemy, enemy lines. lines. Welcome to another week of Packers Football and Behind Enemy Lines, a podcast hosted through PackersTalk.com. You can find us on iTunes at PackersTalk.com, as well as on Twitter at EnemyLinesGB. I'm one of the hosts, Chris Calloway, on Twitter at CCalloway33, and I'm joined, as always, by my dear friend and fellow owner, Amanda, who you can find on Twitter at Amanda R. Geffrey. The Packers head out west to take on the Oakland Raiders Sunday afternoon, but... Big question to start off the show. Have you dried out from last Sunday's game against the Cowboys? I have, but I was pretty dry the whole time. Yeah? Yeah, I had those slick fishing rain suit things on that made me look ridiculous. But, yeah, no, other than, like, my hood, which kind of popped out when I put it on, everything else was dry. That's it wasn't good. too bad. I went, what about with, you? I went with like the 99 cent poncho approach. Oh, that, that worked. <laughs> it worked out pretty well. Uh, it like it, I didn't put a hole in it or anything, but like it only came down about three quarters of the way down my arms, and of course it doesn't go all the way down to your feet. So you know I had it kind of draped over my knees a little bit, so I was able to kind of keep myself in a little tent. But like my my hands got really wet and pruney, but I survived. Don't worry about oh. me. Yeah, it sounds like that poncho was, like, made for a person my size. Yeah, probably. So <laughs> Short. Not, not a man of my, my stature. But it worked. It was a good day. It was it was worth putting up with the rain because the Packers are 28-7 to champions of that game. I guess champions is a little over the top. Victors against the Dallas Cowboys. How was your car ride home with your Cowboys fan husband? It was fine. I think he expected he he wasn't feeling too hopeful because tony romo was out um but basically every five minutes he'd be like why are we paying des bryant why are we paying des bryant he needs to go he needs to go well i mean he had one catch so he's not that great so (laughs) (laughs) i mean but to the packers credit i thought they did a good job defensively you know, they Sam did. Sam Shields went down early in the game, but they didn't really miss a beat in that regard. Granted, Matt Castle is Matt hot Cass- garbage at times, <laughs> but <laughs> garbage. But uh, you know, I thought Demarius Randall and Quentin Rounds did a really good job, and you know, there were a couple of plays that had to go to review as Des Bryant plays have a tendency to do. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, it was, never was a point where I was really you know upset with the defense. No. No, I think in the beginning there was, you know, a little bit of those nerves, a little bit of those frustration of whether or not the offense was going to turn it on and and get something moving, which we later found out that they they would be able to do that. But, yeah, I I felt pretty confident with the defense overall as well. Yeah, and uh, one of those defenders got paid this week. Yes, he did. And, I mean, it was a four-year, $42 million contract for Mike Daniels, a nice, healthy $12 million signing bonus, but... I'd have a pretty good feeling that that's less than he would have got would have gotten on the open market, and that's just one of the reasons that Ted Thompson is able to build the roster he has is because he kind of gets that hometown discount f- to a certain extent. 
hometown discount. I mean, you know, he's going to come back to the Packers for a loyalty. They can lock him up earlier rather than having, you know, the the Jaguars and the Falcons and the Jets competing for his services. And, you know, his price goes up in the offseason. They're able to kind of set the price and just kind of negotiate one-on-one before he hits free agency. Well, and I think I think the timing is, is big when, uh, like you said, I mean, he, he knows when to secure and lock those players in. And I maybe this is foolish of me, but I honestly think that if they can cut a deal, the players want to stay. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't you? Right. <laughs> it, maybe that's just me being biased. It's. I mean, a lot of the times it's those players that – um, like winning, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a few of those in the league. Some certainly value money and contracts over winning, and there's something to be said for that. There, those guys will find a, a home to play in. But Crappy home. Uh, you know, there's a reason that on the Packers rosters, there's like three guys that have played on other teams over the course of their career. Like 95 percent of Packers are only ever Packers. I made that statistic up, but it it seems right. Feels right. It feels right. You know what else felt right? What? Eddie Lacy. You know what? You know what? The run game in general. Yeah. What do you chalk that up to? A good offensive line play? Just <sighs> good hitting the holes? Better play calling? I mean, what what was your kind of takeaway from the run game as a whole? I uh, you know I think that they're. I think it's it's almost twofold. I think Eddie Lacy's. He's feeling a lot of the pressure, and he knows he needs to perform. I think James Starts really looked as good as he has all season, and maybe it's the fact that they went up against Dallas, and Dallas isn't the most awesome defense in the uh, NFL. So they had that going for them. But then I think it also had to do with the offensive line. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, he, he I was able to relax a little bit more this past week just because they were doing their job and keeping him protected. Yeah, and I mean, how many times have I talked about that perfect Eddie Lacy game? A hundred times. Yeah, this and that was that. You know, this was pretty darn close to that. Twenty-four carries, one hundred twenty-four yards, and a touchdown. You know, they didn't give it to him thirty-five times. They didn't wear him down. They were able to spell him for different series. Get a real change of pace with uh, James Starks. Eleven carries for seventy-one yards, and this was like the the perfect. I mean, play calling to a to a cent. I mean, obviously the guys have to go out there and perform to a little bit, but you have to put them in positions to win. And you know, Mike McCarthy calling the plays this week, I thought really, really did that, and you saw the results bear out. It's it's true, and you know what I you know what I love the most about that combo. I mean, everybody wants to have a run game and to have a passing game because then your offense is more versatile. But when you have two running backs, one of them isn't dominant. They they were so they're such different running backs that the defense can't actually use like what am I saying they have they have to like transition themselves for each running back they can't they can't use the same I mean Eddie Lacy's forceful and James Starks he's quick and he's sly mm-hmm. I mean you got two different types of people coming at you there. You better be ready for both. Right. I mean, from a tackling perspective, from a coverage perspective, I mean, I know they do throw the ball to Eddie Lacy a little bit, but uh, James Stark's way more active in the screen game, which I thought they used well at, at times. And it just is a different, more dynamic offense. And, you know, I, we've talked so many times about losing Jordy Nelson kind of has, has lost that downfield dynamic. But if you can, you know, spread the field a little bit more horizontally and use that screen game and, you know, hit the holes with Eddie Lacy and bounce it outside with James Starks, you know, that's a different positive that I think this this offense has needed and is needed to kind of evolve and make them into a more – more of a competitive playoff team. Yeah, I I agree with you. But back but do to, you feel better about the team? Um, I mean, I I don't feel worse about the team after a twenty eight to seven victory. It, it, uh, <laughs> it, it you know what I mean? Like it wasn't. Um, it was a little bit closer than that score indicated. Those two late touchdowns right. helped helped them pull away, but it felt like Mike McCarthy. Like this was kind of the the spark. The the little tweak the little something that this offense was was desperately craving and it wasn't perfect you know it wasn't a flawless game plan but more often than not he he 
push the right buttons. Right. I think that I think you hit the nail on the head there. It just seemed like there were struggles, but we were able to overcome them. We didn't let them bear down on the whole game. Mm -hmm. Like that uh, fourth down right by the end zone, by the end we were sitting on. um, Early in the game, you know, the fact that they went to fourth down and went for it, you're kind of thinking, okay, this is like the exact situation in Seattle in the NFC playoff game where they kicked the field goal. Yeah. You know? And I think... I think Mike McCarthy kind of felt at that point like he had to go for it. Like his hands were kind of tied. He had to go for it. And I'm okay with the fact that they they came up short. I would have liked to get Eddie Lacy the ball, you know, in either third or fourth down there. They went with Starks and then a sneak with Rodgers, and neither of those worked. So, like I said, it wasn't flawless. But conceptually, I think that things were much improved. No, I I agree with you, too. It's – it's interesting. Like, I want to just, I don't know. It's, I think I'm adjusting to knowing, like, hey, each game is going to be a little more like, hey, I'm not sure what's going to happen. We could come out and play really awesome, or we could struggle a little bit. Mm-hmm. I feel I feel a little better after this last game. Okay. I think, I think it was the mentality that w- went behind. I don't know. I just felt like, they never let themselves get behind. They were always stayed ahead of the game, even if they didn't perform the best. I don't know. I just it felt a little different than the last couple of games. I felt like last couple of games we've been, well, we have been. We've been coming up from behind and trying to struggle to take the lead. Mm-hmm. And with the way this team is designed this year, if they can be a run first team from here on out and then still have the best quarterback in the game to kind of, you know, be a change of pace, make things, you know, give it a different look. Right. I'm okay with that. I mean, if they're a run first team and then have Aaron Rodgers to turn to, there are worse things that this team could be. Agreed. Agreed. So there's three games left in the regular season at Oakland at Arizona before home against the Minnesota Vikings. Arizona and Minnesota likely going to be playoff teams with the Packers. Oakland has looked much better this year. The Packers 9-4 and four on the season right now. Realistically, what are your kind of hopes for the best for the last three games? Are you hoping that this is still uh, an eleven and five team, or do you think they can run the table, go twelve and four, or do you still kind of not ready to get your expectations up that high quite yet? Oh man, um, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I feel like there's definitely a loss in one of these three games. Okay. I I like to say. Only one. I think I think they'll be, you know, everybody's been writing off Oakland, and I've just kind of, you know, maybe now doing my research, I'm like, eh, it could be a tougher game than we're, and we've uh, been giving them credit for. But uh, I don't know. Uh, Cardinals, they're they're pretty solid, and they're going to be at home. Mm-hmm. And who knows what the Vikings will come back with? It's uh, it's always hard to judge on a rivalry team. You know, they they pull hat tricks and stuff out of their sleeves all the time, and then we don't know what to do. Yeah. Right. I want them to, to you know, dominate Oakland, Oakland this weekend. I want them to dominate Oakland this weekend and clinch a playoff berth. I think a, a home field advantage is a little pie in the sky right now. So I think if they go beat Oakland and clinch a playoff berth, then they can kind of whew, exhale a little bit and then approach the um, – the Arizona game as kind of a, okay, this is our competition. We want to go in there and obviously try to win, but kind of maybe not show your hand completely. Understand what you're up against. Right. And you could maybe go a little bit vanilla. You know, you don't throw out all your trick plays. You don't, you know, get completely crazy. But you kind of, uh, you scale your game plan back, game plan back a little bit and, you know, if you lose that game, it's okay because you're probably not going to get that home field, like I said. And, you know, if they've already got the division clinched after week 16, heading at home week 17, you know, I'm not opposed to sitting Aaron Rodgers. Get some Scotty Tolzien out there? I mean, why not? He got one snap <laughs> on, uh, on, on Sunday or a couple of kneel downs or whatever. But uh, 
I mean, I mean, maybe not sit him the whole game, but treat it like a preseason game, play him a quarter, get him out of there, and just, you know, I think we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit here, yeah. but, you know, I'm okay with them clinching this week and then kind of addressing things from there on out. Yeah, I mean, I'll take that too. I think I think it'd be, it'd, it'd be perfect if they won this game, and then I feel like they could really – feel like there's been too there's been so much pressure because they haven't maybe played up to expectation or they've they feel like they're they've got to compete with all these like teams like the Panthers and you know people are still talking about Tom Brady and they still want to be at that level but they're not quite there yet and I think mm-hmm. that they just need to get into the playoffs and then worry about the next team that they're playing and what the playoffs are going to bring Well, the Packers have the easiest playoff clinching scenario in the league. Win and you're in. And that starts on the road in Oakland this weekend. I think it's about time to bring in our guest. I think it is too. Let's talk to him. Now we'd like to welcome our guest, Jimmy Durkin, to the show. Jimmy covers the Oakland Raiders for the Oakland Tribune and the San Jose Mercury News. You can find his work and follow him on Twitter at Jimmy underscore Durkin. Welcome to the show, Jimmy. We're happy to have you on here. All right. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's start off with a broad question. The Raiders haven't had a winning season in over a decade, but it's hard to deny that progress has been made. Can you kind of give us a general sense of what it's like to be a Raiders fan in 2015? I mean, I think it's it's kind of a weird situation. There's finally some, some reason for hope. There's signs of progress. Obviously still kind of under that cloud of, is this team even going to be here next year? So that that's kind of one of the weirder dynamics is that, you know, there's there's reason for hope. There's there's some good young talent on offense, on defense, um, and, and then there's reason to be excited. But, uh, you know, really nobody at this point knows if they're even going to still be in Oakland next year. So, uh, you know, I, I think on the football field you're seeing – um, you know, something to, to feel good about, but uh, it, it is a little bit of a weird dynamic when you consider all the off-field stuff. Right, and we'll we'll get to that part of it in just a little bit, but let's come back to the guys on the field. Uh, you know, some of the necessary building blocks of the future seem to definitely be there. Guys like Derek Carr, Amari Cooper, and Khalil Mack, just to name a few. And starting on defense, you know, Khalil Mack had his outstanding game uh, on Sunday, five sacks against the Broncos. Um, how good is this guy, and kind of how good do you think he can be? I mean, I think he's developing into, you know, really one of the elite, you know, top five or so pass rushers in the NFL. And uh, you know, he, he's a great guy to, to build your defense around. Um, he's kind of a quiet, hardworking guy. Uh, and, you know, the, the weirdest thing is, you know, for so long, you looked at last year, everybody was saying he was making an impact, making an impact, but the numbers weren't showing up. And even early through this year, um, until the last couple of weeks, he was he was trudging along. Uh, I mean, just three weeks ago, he had five sacks. Now, all of a sudden, you know, he had you know two straight weeks with two sacks, blows up with, with five sacks against the Broncos, and now he's your NFL leader. And I think he's still learning, you know, a lot about, you know, how to, how to play guys, how to, you know, use the right moves against the right guy and, and exploit weaknesses. But um, as he continues to learn that and use his, his just physical gifts of size and strength and, and quickness, I mean, I think you're going to see a guy that every year is going to be in the Pro Bowl and, and up there among the, you know, the, the leaders in sacks in the NFL. Packers head coach Mike McCarthy had a quote this week saying that the Raiders play defense the way you're supposed to. Can you give us a sense of what he means by that? Well, I mean, I think he means that, you know, they're a physical defense. That's kind of what they try to do to you. You know, their their philosophy is that they want to stop the run and that they don't want to give up big plays deep in the passing game. And that's that's worked for the most part. Uh, they've had some lapses, you know, uh, where they've been gouged on the ground, be it against Pittsburgh or Minnesota, and, and some games where they've given up a lot of underneath passing. Um, but they have done a pretty good job of not allowing – um, you know, not allowing receivers to get over the top on them, and they're not giving up a ton of big plays. And, and so they, I think that's what we saw a lot on Sunday with with the Broncos is the is Denver was moving the ball pretty well early in that game, 
and they'd get in the red zone, and the Raiders would kind of shut it down and, and hold them to field goals, and, and they just kind of kept themselves in the game until their offense could get going. And, I mean, they've had their, their defensive struggles uh, at, at a lot of times this year. I mean, when their pass rush wasn't there early in the season, you saw them giving up a lot more. Um, for whatever reason, as soon as Alden Smith got suspended for a year, Khalil Mack just took off. His pass rush has improved. The pass rush overall as a whole team has improved. And I think that's allowed them to kind of get away with a little bit more in the defensive backfield because the secondary has been a weakness for them um, outside of a couple of guys. Uh, they, they've struggled back there. But um, now that the pass rush is showing up, you're seeing a little bit better defense. And I think defensively, obviously, the approach starts uh, at the top with Jack Del Rio. He's a defensive-minded guy. He's been a head coach in the league before. But, you know, this go-round with the Raiders, kind of what have your impressions been of Del Rio this year? I mean, I think he's he's brought a, a professionalism to the Raiders that you haven't always seen. You know, he's he's brought a, a seriousness, a, you know, kind of a no nonsense approach. You know, the players uh, respect him; they respect the coaches that he has on his staff because you know they've they've had success in this league either as a player or coach or as both. And and you know, in in, in the past, you look at look at past Raiders coaches and. You know, a lot of guys just probably haven't quite been qualified for that position. Um, he, he's a guy that, you know, he, yeah, I mean, he, he's done it in this league before, and so I think you know, the players really respect him. Um, and he, he knows, he knows that, the, you know, this team isn't there yet. Um, he, he spoke today of, uh, with confidence that they will build a dominant defense. Um, it's going to take some time. It's going to take more players. But I, I think, you know, that, that's what he has in mind is he, he knows that right now the offensive pieces are pretty good and they probably have, you know, the guys there in place to, to keep progressing and have a pretty dynamic offense that they've shown at times this year. And if he can get that defense, you know, short up and, and playing like they did on Sunday more often than not, uh, you know, the Raiders have a chance in the next couple of years to make some noise. Well, we'd be remiss if we didn't spend more time talking about the legendary Charles Woodson, who, of course, is near and dear to the hearts of Packers fans. There was a little bit of bad blood when he was released by the Packers in 2013, um, being that everyone thought that he was being released because he was so old. So there might be a little bit of a chip on his shoulder in, in this game in particular. But how is Woodson still able to do what he's doing at such a high level at, at the age of 39? Well, I mean, it's amazing and even more so when you consider that he you know, dislocated his shoulder in the season opener and hasn't missed a game. Um, and I mean that it, not to say that it hasn't affected him. He's he's not nearly the tackler that he probably wishes he could be. I mean, there's plays where he has to just go out there and, and kind of try with one arm to to bring a guy down or dive at a guy's leg. Um, but uh, he keeps finding himself around the ball. You know, five interceptions, uh, three fumble recoveries. Uh, yeah, so he he keeps making impact plays. Uh, you know, he. He's, he's certainly not the player he once was, but he, he's definitely the best player in the Raiders secondary and, and certainly capable of, of still playing in this league. And yeah, I mean, he, he said it today that he's, he does have, you know, not necessarily just a chip on his shoulder toward the Packers, but really toward the rest of the league because he, the league thought he was done. You know, he had very little interest when he, uh, when he got released. There, was, there weren't teams uh, knocking on his door to sign him. You know, they thought he was done and, and so I think it's, it's been a, a season where he's enjoyed kind of proving to people that he had kind of one last hurrah. I mean, he, he's going to go to the Pro Bowl this year. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if this is his final run, if these are his last few games. But uh, he's had a memorable final year if it is indeed the, the end for him. Well, let's uh, switch to the other side of the ball offensively. Another guy that might find himself in the Pro Bowl in years down the road is Derek Carr. Um, it seems like the, the consensus is, is that Oakland has found its guy, which, you know, the importance of that can't really be understated for a franchise. Um, what are your impressions of Derek Carr, you know, progressing here in year number two? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it goes to the weapons that he now has. I mean, he's, you look at his rookie year, I mean, he... He, it really, the, the success he had was pretty admirable, considering that he didn't. I mean, he didn't have anything resembling a number one receiver on his team. Um, you know, you know, James Jones was around, and you know, but they they just didn't have guys that could get you know get down the field. Um, Amari Cooper, who is you know who's hit kind of a little bit of a rookie wall, it seems like right now. It gives him a, a guy that he can he can really count on, can be a dynamic guy. Uh, early in the season, we saw a lot with him being able to make great plays after the catch. Uh, Michael Crabtree, you know, that, that duo 
gives him a legitimate one-two punch at receiver. And so I, I think that's helped a lot. But also, I mean, he's he's progressed. He's um, you know he, he's throwing the ball down the field more again a lot because of the weapons. But uh, he, he's a guy that he protects the ball well. He doesn't th- you know doesn't throw a lot of turnovers. But he does pick and choose his times uh, where he's going to take chances. He's been really good in the red zone his entire career. Um, finds ways to, to squeeze the ball in tight windows, you know, in the red zone, which is, you know, what you need to do if you're going to score down there sometimes. So, yeah, I mean, he, he's progressing really nicely. And, uh, you know, the, the last few games haven't been his best. He's kind of slowed down the pace that he had early in the season when it looked like he was a lock to throw for 4,000 yards. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, he's, he's certainly proven to the Raiders that, uh, that he is their guy of the future. They don't have to go into the offseason worrying about quarterback position and, when you're a team that still needs to make some improvements, it's nice to not have to worry about the quarterback spot. Uh, I saw on your Twitter feed some allusions to comparisons between Derek Carr and, and Aaron Rodgers. Both are obviously Bay Area guys, but do you buy into the on-field comparisons too? I mean, I think a, a lot of it, you, you see guys that are you know pretty similar height and weight. They they have similar mechanics. They uh, you know they, they do things fairly similarly. Uh, as quarterbacks, you know, the results obviously cannot be compared at this point. Yeah, they may have similar stats. They might, you know, stat-wise this year alone they're similar, but, you know, it, what Aaron's been able to accomplish in the NFL is, is nothing compared to what Derek has. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I, I think it's it's way too early to be making that comparison, but uh, James Jones was kind of the first guy to bring it up last year, having obviously played with both of them. And, and so, uh, you know, the, you, you have seen, uh, you know, th- there are – some similarities just when you watch their game. But uh, in terms of results and in terms of everything Aaron's been able to do, uh, I think it's a little bit too early. But a couple years down the road, maybe uh, it'll become a little bit more of a fair comparison. You mentioned uh, Amari Cooper. I mean, he's shown he can be ridiculously good. He came on to the season, you know, with a big bang. But uh, he's been especially quiet as of late. No catches on Sunday against Denver. You mentioned that rookie wall. Is that basically what you kind of chalk up his his recent struggles to? You know, it could be. It could be some physical stuff. Um, he, he hit a little stretch where he was struggling uh, a few weeks back when uh, he had a, it was listed on the injury report and had a couple you know, missed or limited practices because of a quad injury. And, and, you know, I think you you saw that slow him for a game or two, and then he bounced back and and had a good game. And and now he, you know, they've they've had him listed with, they had him last week listed with a foot injury. Um, It's it's hard to tell. I think he's a guy that if he's not at his physical peak, then he's not getting in and out of his breaks nearly as much and not getting as wide open and, and creating as much space. You, know, you you also look at last week going up against Denver. I mean, that is probably your best secondary that there is in the league, and they can lock down good receivers pretty well. And I mean, the Raiders tried targeting him; they, they threw it to him eight times, and you know there was there was I think one or two that maybe went off his hands and, and got close, but they were really locked on him pretty well. Uh, so I mean, I, I think somewhat of it is, is hitting a little bit of a rookie wall. It's, you know, you're getting into December when these guys aren't used to still playing at this point. Um, you know, although for, for him at Alabama, you do play a, a little bit longer season than, uh, than both, but, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how he, how he, how he comes down the stretch in these final three games. And if he can, you know, you'd like to see him have at least one or two more kind of dynamic performances like we saw earlier in the year, just, uh, to give people a little reminder going into the off season of, of what they have here. Well, we, we asked the same question of our guests from the San Diego Chargers earlier this season, and we talked about it a little bit to kick things off here, too. But if you were a betting man, Jimmy, what city will the Raiders be calling home next season? I still think they're going to end up staying in Oakland and, and probably being stuck at the Coliseum for at least uh, another year or so. Uh, it's always it, it's always felt like uh, you know the NFL would prefer to have, if they can somehow make it possible to have, the Rams and or Chargers together down there in L.A. and and the Raiders have always felt like the third choice. You know that that keeps changing back and forth, depending on if if, if the Rams stadium project is is gaining steam or or you know what, a million different things. Um, and you know and even lately, just everything you're hearing, it's becoming to the point where I wouldn't necessarily be shocked if if the decisions put off another year but if, if i were to bet i i feel like the raiders are probably going to be stuck here um you know get to stick around for at least another year or so but 
uh, you know, it, it seems like that changes every day, so it, it's hard to really make too bold of a prediction. So speaking of predictions, kind of going into uh, the game this weekend, it was a kind of a weird low-scoring game between the Raiders and the Broncos. It ended up being 15-12. to 12. The Packers' offense seems like it's getting back on track. What kind of game are you expecting between the Packers and the Raiders this weekend? And maybe which way do you see it going? Is it a game kind of in the teens again, or could it creep up maybe toward the 30s? I, I feel like this one probably gets into the 30s, um, you know, it, at least on the winning side. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you see somewhere like the Packers winning 31-24. Uh, yeah, I think the I mean, the Raiders offense hasn't been humming along like it was earlier in the year when they were, you know, a top 10 or so offense in the league. Uh, but, I mean, they, they feel like – you feel like they're due for a game where they break out a little bit. Uh, Carr kind of got things going a little bit in the second half last week and – you know, throwing two touchdowns, throwing uh, you know a game winner there to to beat the Broncos. So I mean, I, I think their offense might might be able to get back going a little bit better than where they were. Um, you know, I don't I don't see them having another defensive performance like they had against Denver. I think a lot of that was uh, you know Brock Osweiler is, is isn't quite as as good as we maybe all thought he was and. And uh, he didn't get a whole lot of help from his receivers, who dropped some pretty crucial passes. So, yeah, I mean, if I if I were to yes, yeah, I I say I could see somewhere like a thirty-one twenty-four type score. Well, you know, I I think that uh, the Packers' offense is definitely kind of moving more towards uh, the way that we like to see it, Chris and I at least. Um, you know, I'm I'm thinking that the Packers are going to show up hopefully get that running game going right away, and we'll see a score around 28-10, 28-14. Um, I'm putting a lot of confidence in our defense again. Yeah, what do you think, Chris? The defense did look good against the Cowboys, and uh, I'm hoping it's a similar type of performance, and I think it'll be a similar type of game. I kind of like it being, you know, 31-20, like you said, but maybe, you know, pulling away just a little bit late and closer than the score indicates because I really like this Raiders team from what I've seen, and I hope they could be, uh, you know, competitive down the stretch and and in the years to come with the building blocks they have. So, uh, Jimmy, we we really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, Hopefully you uh, enjoy the weekend, the game, and uh, be glad that you don't have to come back to the snowy, rainy slop in uh, Wisconsin. Yeah, well, I'll be in Kansas City in a couple of weeks, so we'll see what conditions are like there. We were we were in the snow in Denver last week, and uh, you know we may have it to finish off the year in KC. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it, it, it's pretty nice out here right now, although it is a little colder than normal for California. So uh, we'll uh, at least we have sun out. Yeah, sunshine certainly a, a beautiful thing. So Jimmy, uh, we appreciate your time, and uh, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Jimmy. We appreciate everyone for tuning in to the Week 15 edition of Behind Enemy Lines. The Packers head to Oakland to take on the Raiders this Sunday afternoon. Hopefully there will be some sunshine in California. Once again, you can find our podcast on Twitter at EnemyLinesGB. I'm Chris Calloway, and you can find me at CCalloway33. And I'm Amanda Geffrey. You can find me at Amanda R. Geffrey. Thank you to our guest, Jimmy Durkin, for joining us. You can find him on Twitter at Jimmy underscore Durkin. Remember, check out all of our podcasts on PackersTalk.com and follow Behind Enemy Lines on Twitter at EnemyLinesGB. Until next time, Go Go Pack Go! This Green Bay Packers podcast is brought to you by Mayfield Sports Marketing our official sports marketing agent for player appearances. To book a Packers player for your next event, go to PackersTalk.com and click on Player Appearances. Are you looking for some signed Packer memorabilia? Look no further than Waukesha Sports Cards. If the Green Bay Packer can sign it, Waukesha Sports Cards has it. Check our website for upcoming Packer player and legend signings. Go to WaukeshaSportsCards.com.